Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I am your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really happy to have with me once again my friend, John Rubino. Uh, he, the best place to go to keep up with John's work is uh, dollarcollapse.com, dollarcollapse.com. John runs that site, and uh, he is um, co-author with Gold Money's James Turk uh, on, a, on a really great book, uh, The Money Bubble, What to Do Before It Pops. And, and uh, also, John has been the author of a number of other books, uh, all worth taking a look at and, and absorbing because uh, he brings his his background on Wall Street and uh, in the markets uh, and really sort of helps the, the rubber hit the road with respect to how we should plan our lives and uh, and how we should invest our money. So I'm really pleased to have John with me. Thanks for joining me again, John. Hey, Jay. Good to talk to you again. Always good to have you on. I've titled today's show, Investing During the Petrodollar's Demise. Well, uh, so far, it doesn't look like the petrodollar is, is in demise, so I imagine a lot of people are wondering if I'm playing with a full deck here. But, uh, John, uh, what's your outlook for the dollar, the petrodollar? Uh, well, well the, the, the petrodollar is, um, is based on the deal we cut with Saudi Arabia back in the 1970s when we said, we'll protect you if you only take dollars for your oil. And that basically made the dollar the, um, the, the necessary currency if you were going to trade oil, which everybody does, so everybody had to own dollars. And it, it reinforced the position of the dollar as the world's most important currency. And it, it has maintained um, the, the petrodollar status um, ever since, until just lately. And now things are starting to change in the Middle East and around the world. You know, a lot of countries don't consider the U.S. dollar as the world's reserve currency, a good thing from their point of view, because that gives the U.S. a huge amount of power. You know, it lets us borrow unlimited amounts of money and maintain a military empire that uh, that pushes a lot of other countries around. So China, mm-hmm. Russia, India, countries like that uh, would like to use their own currencies for foreign trade. And they're starting to do that. They're cutting a lot of bilateral trade deals where they don't need the dollar. They use rupees and rubles and yuan. And, and um, so we're cut out of that trade. And now in the Middle East, um, things are changing in part because of our behaviors and in part because of kind of the natural evolution of, uh, of the Islamic world, um, such that not everybody's using dollars there anymore. And uh, basically, Saudi Arabia is still the key to this. And they're not happy with how we have, in, from their point of view, cozied up to Iran, who is their mm-hmm. main rival in the Middle East. And so it looks like Saudi Arabia is not as wedded to the whole petrodollar monopoly as it used to be. And so it could be that uh, the dollar isn't the sole currency that is used for oil trading in the future. Um, And other things being equal, that would weaken the dollar and and make it less important in the world. But other things aren't equal because the rest of the world is in such chaos right now. We've got massive capital inflows happening from all the countries that are terrified that their own systems are going to spin out of control. And that is buoying the dollar. It's making it more valuable than it would be otherwise, and uh, which makes sense. I mean, if you are rich and you're in Brazil or China or Russia, are you going to leave your money sitting around in some local bank or are you going to get a Miami condo or are you going to buy treasury bonds and, and uh, store them in an offshore account? Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to do the latter probably because that's what most people in the world are doing. And so we've got this huge, this tidal wave of capital flowing in right now. And that's making the dollar um, really the only currency in the world that's actually strong right now. Uh, And so when that tide recedes, that will be a very risky time for the dollar because it won't have the support of the, the oil trade to the extent that it has in the past. Mm-hmm. And it, it won't be as in demand, and you know, at that point, it'll probably go down, if not before. I mean, the the other thing that will affect the dollar is when the U.S. economy finally blows up. You know, which just looking at the numbers, we're not that far from that. You know, right now we are the um, the least ugly country in the world, and so that's not the same thing as being a good looking country. You know, our mm-hmm. our finances are horrendous. And 
in a vacuum, if you were just looking at us, you'd say, whoa, that, that's a weak currency country. They're going to have to devalue really aggressively mm-hmm. to get out from under their excessive debts. Mm-hmm. And that's still out there. That's going to have to happen. But in the meantime, in the uh, you know, immediate present, um, there's a lot of capital flowing in from places that are even worse managed than we are. And, uh, and that's saying something. You know, to, say, to look at our numbers and say that these other countries are in worse shape means those other countries are in really, really bad shape. Mm-hmm. You know, China, obviously. We, we've talked about China's overborrowing in the last five or six years, and now they're, they're resulting credit crisis. And uh, Russia is an oil exporting country um, where oil has gone from a $110 a barrel to below 30 today. And Brazil is just an absolute basket case. They've got spiking inflation and a shrinking economy at the same time. Europe is um, is on the verge of an implosion, it looks like, or at least the, the Eurozone and the European Union's rules are going to have to be changed in a really dramatic way if they want to survive as entities because they've got the, uh, um, the, the stuff that's going on with really millions of Middle Eastern refugees right now coming over, swamping the, the social safety net and behaving very badly. And then they've got a lot of separatist movements and, uh, and fringe political movements that are moving to the mainstream and, and getting uh, majority votes in a lot of elections. And these guys are anti-Euro or anti-EU, anti-austerity. They're, they're opposed to most of the rules that now govern the European Union. So they're in trouble. So the, the world is a mess right now. And uh, there doesn't seem to be any kind of an immediate solution, which implies that... Uh, 2016 is going to be a really fascinating year in which any number of things could blow up and two or three things should blow up. All right. What are the two or three that should blow up? Well, the two or three that should go are China should have to devalue its currency really aggressively because it just borrowed way too much money and it's got all these, you know, the ghost cities, blah, blah, blah. We know that story. Yes. And, um, and the idea that they're still growing is really based on fictitious numbers that, uh, you know, everybody's known their numbers were always fictitious, but you could go to uh, a Chinese city and see all the cranes building buildings and it looked like there was really aggressive growth. So you kind of knew they were growing to an extent, but that turned out to be a mirage because of borrowed money. They borrowed, they built things that shouldn't have been built. Now those things aren't generating any kind of cash flow. And so they've got huge sections of their economy that's going broke. So the idea that they're growing is probably fictitious. I suspect they're shrinking. So they have to devalue the yuan really aggressively. Uh Europe, for reasons we just talked about, will will have to devalue the euro really aggressively if it wants to keep Spain, Italy, Portugal, Greece in the eurozone. Because the only way they can survive um, in a common currency union is if that currency is extremely weak. Uh So, And then Brazil has to have its crisis. They haven't had the crisis yet. You know, they're just kind of drifting in that direction where lots of things are going wrong, but they haven't really hit bottom. So those are things that almost certainly have to happen in 2016. And then, you know, the U.S. has an awful lot of underlying problems that will be exacerbated by a stronger dollar. You know, when when we say the euro has to be devalued, that's exactly the same thing as saying the dollar has to be revalued. It has to get Uh more valuable. And so let the dollar go up another 10 or 15% from here and uh, corporate earnings in the U.S., which are already falling. You know, we're in an um, earnings recession where we're, we're having two straight quarters of dropping corporate profitability. Uh-huh. Um, and a lot of that is due to a too strong dollar. So let the dollar go up from here and U.S. corporations will report some shockingly bad numbers in 2016 and 2017. And if, if it's still true that share prices are determined in the long run by underlying corporate earnings, then falling earnings ought to give us falling share prices. So we could have easily, you know, a earnings recession leading to a bear market in equities here, which in turn would lead to, lead to an across-the-board recession in the U.S., um, at a time when we have so much debt that it's not clear we can survive another recession. You know, any recession will turn into a 2008, 2009 style crisis. So, and all of this stuff is just right here. You know, it's this quarter, next quarter, the quarter after. So it's 2016 story. So, John, you're saying we can't have a garden variety recession. It's going to be either slow growth or uh, massive 
de- decrease of growth or an implosion, if you will, a, a depression? Well, things that didn't used to be systemically risky are now systemically <laughs> risky because we borrowed so much money. Yeah. You know, p- picture a family that um, if they've got a bunch of money in the bank and the roof leaks, no problem. They just fix the roof. But if they've maxed out all their credit cards, they have no money in the bank whatsoever, and the roof leaks then fixing that roof could bankrupt the family. Well, that we're like that family now. You know, Anything that goes wrong is really dangerous for us because it could blow up the junk bond market. It could blow up the derivatives market. It could push equities down by 30 or 40 or 50% instead of just 10 or 15% like would normally happen in, uh, in a, a typical correction slash bear market. Mm-hmm. Um, and all of those things could um, snowball. You know, once one thing gets going, it causes other things to blow up because everybody's over leveraged. You know, we've got all these hedge funds out there that have taken really aggressive positions in volatile things that are now, um, for a lot of hedge funds, being very volatile in the wrong direction. So a lot of hedge funds are going to blow up, which means they've got to liquidate their portfolios, which puts pressure on other assets. You know, there are so many things that are interrelated and can go wrong and one cause one domino to fall, which causes another to fall. And and that's where we are right now. We're at a really Mm -hmm. fragile stage in this long, long, long credit bubble. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that's why James Turek and I called the, the book that we did the money bubble because basically this is a this is not a um, a junk bond bubble or a tech stock bubble you know something limited to one discrete mm-hmm. sector that mm-hmm. when it blows up it'll hurt those investors but that's it uh, this is our money that we have inflated beyond uh, recognition really you know the, the credit system in the the developed world is leveraged beyond anything that we've ever seen in history. You know, so what what happens to unwind it is probably going to be commensurately extreme, mm-hmm. and uh, and that's the bursting of the money bubble. And, All right, John. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh no, you you go ahead, Jay. No, no, I was just going that. to ask you then. That you, so we have this this petrodollar that was created after. Uh, you know, by Henry Kissinger after Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1971. Shortly thereafter, Kissinger sets up this uh, petrodollar. Um, <clears throat> you know, the the dollar is remaining so strong. Uh, what what could, at the same time, we we see the the BRICS are definitely seeming not to be all that pleased with the way they've been treated uh, in the dollar area, uh, and they're setting up their own system. They're setting up their own institutions similar to what we have in the West. And um, I know I read that uh, Russia is selling their oil to China for gold. Are, are you familiar with that? Yeah, I've heard that story. And uh, Iran was also um, selling oil for gold. And uh, so, so, you know, that, that makes sense. I mean, gold is money. And so it, it makes sense that there's kind of a black market out there mm-hmm. in which other things besides dollars are being traded by, by countries that aren't yet ready just to stand up and, and defy the petrodollar system. But a lot of these guys are, are willing to just put it right out there. You know, Russia and China are using their own currencies for bilateral trade. And India is involved in that too. You mm-hmm. know? And, and uh, so I think we'll see more and more of that. And, and part of that is just a, a natural evolution of the financial system. As these countries become more consequential, they want their currencies to become more consequential, and, and that's as it should be. You know, there's no reason why we can't use uh, um, rubles or something in, in a lot of trade. If Russia is a big, important country, why, why isn't their currency used for stuff like that? So mm-hmm. it, part of um, what's happening and what the U.S. is kind of fighting against is an inevitable natural evolution of the world getting richer and more stable – um, and us being 5% of the population. So we, mm-hmm. we shouldn't dominate very many aspects of the global life if there, we're just 5% of, of the people in the world. You know, the, the other aggregations of people should be consequential also. And the fact that we were so dominant after World War II was, was more of a historical accident than anything else. And it's something that would eventually have to be um, reversed out or evolved away from. And that's that's kind of what's happening now. You know, there's no reason to be surprised by the dollar losing a little bit of its reserve currency status over time. We have, uh, yeah, I mean, with, with the United States uh, being the victors of World War II, the West uh, 
coming out of that. Uh, clearly, that's uh, you know the spoils of World War II, as it were. But it seems to me, in my my view, that we have vastly abused that uh, that power that flow that that resulted from the Second War, <clears throat> uh, and uh, creating dollars. And and certainly, when Kissinger went to Saudi Arabia and arranged the petrodollar after the uh, gold was taken from the dollar, that seems to have set the uh, set the table for this massive abuse of money creation that the U.S. has used for its military-industrial complex to now it seems to try to force countries to uh, to stay with the current system, with the dollar system, right? Well, yeah, we're, we're fighting tooth and claw to keep our privilege. <laughs> and, and we won't be able to do it. I mean, short of a catastrophe in a lot of other countries that leaves us standing and, and them not standing. Uh, but we really did abuse the privilege of having the world's reserve currency. And, you know, that's a basic lesson in human nature is power is always abused. And so we should, in a, um, a sustainable system, you want a balance of lots of different interests that keep each other in check rather than one dominant power, because that one dominant power will always be corrupted by its power. And so that, you know, the best we can hope for in the world in the future is balance of power politics for as far as the eye can see, because that's the only solution. There is no libertarian utopia or socialist utopia out there where everybody believes the same thing and acts according to a, a, a consistent, coherent set of rules. That's not how human societies work. So um, the U.S. is just going to have to get used to other countries being powerful and being you know, militarily dominant in their neighborhoods and having currencies that compete with ours and, and, you know, and competing with us in all the other aspects of life. That's just the way it is. All right, we've got only two minutes to go yet, John, and I, I hardly have scratched the surface here in terms of the things I want to ask you about. Yeah. But um, what's your anticipation with regard to the Fed activities now? Will, will they cave in on raise on, on uh, interest rates here if the equity markets continue to go much lower? Larry Summers uh, is saying they shouldn't have raised rates anyway. But <laughs> and, and the other thing is that we're raising rates, as you pointed out, at a time when the economy is getting uh, is not strong at all. Well, we're raising rates at a time when not only is the um, local economy, the domestic economy, um, shrinking by a lot of measures, but the, the world is in chaos. You know, normally, um, any time in the last 20 or 30 years, this kind of stuff would have been met with a deluge of easy money from the Fed. But this time around, we're contracting the money supply, we're raising interest rates. I think they've got to reverse it out. Sometime in 2016, a crisis happens that will um, cause the Fed to just take it all back. They'll say, you know what? We were wrong, and things have changed, and from now on, we're going to cut interest rates, we're going to increase the money supply, we're, we'll do that debt jubilee we've been talking about. All right, and what's that going to do for the precious metals, John? I, it probably makes them go through the roof. But all right. That's just a guess. Yeah. That will, time will tell. Unfortunately, we're out of time, and so we don't have much time to tell, unfortunately. Uh, I want to thank you very much, John, for being with me again. Sorry for the abbreviated time. We'll get you on for a longer period the next time, hopefully. Great. 